So I think if you are passionate about something, there's like get into it now and find someone to help you out with it because social impact is all about collaboration and um, very much, yeah, about giving it a shot. Welcome. You're listening to the Young Changemakers podcast. In these episodes, your co-hosts, Sarah, George, and Anastasia, will be talking to passionate young individuals from around the world to explore how they are making lasting impact in their local communities. So cozy up, listen in, because inspiring stories are waiting to be heard and power lies within you. Darcy, welcome to the Young Changemakers podcast. Um, I think I've had you on the, the list of change makers to get in touch with for a while. A long time running now but it's good to see you albeit virtually again um, since meeting you at the, the Young Changemakers Summit last year. Yeah I'm looking forward to it George. Um, hopefully people can understand our accents. <laughs> On our previous podcast host meeting with Sarah and uh, Anastasia they made it clear that we had to speak proper English none of the Australiana type language and I apologise to the <laughs> listeners who don't quite, you know, understand some of our jargon. <laughs> well, I can see your eyebrows are furrowing as you concentrate on pronouncing each word perfectly. So we'll just, I'll, I'll call you out if um, you drop into the slang too much. No, terrific. Um, so Darcy, I'm, today we're going to talk about all things um, Kua and your social coffee enterprise. The first a good place to start is how did you stumble into the, the world of social impact and was there a light bulb moment? Good question. Um, there was a light bulb moment, but I think it was an accident. Uh, I studied renewable energy engineering um, here in Sydney and replied to an email that I got sent from a lecturer asking if I wanted to spend my summer holidays in Uganda as part of a pilot program. I thought it sounded like an interesting opportunity, so I replied to that email and three months later there I was in the centre of Uganda with about 10 other uh, engineering students. And the idea was that our problem solving skills as engineers would be matched with uh, the agricultural expertise of local students and together we would help uh, subs uh, subsistence farmers transition to the cash economy. And we were there for about a month, but what we found was that living in Sydney really didn't prepare you for the problems that farmers were facing in Uganda, and we really struggled to uh, implement any meaningful solutions. But what did happen was one of the students that we were working with um, had grown up in Mount Elgon, which is Uganda's coffee growing region. And we spent a lot of time chatting to him and became quite good mates. And we compared the two stories of growing up in Australia, I mean, coffee drinking culture versus growing up in Mount Elgon, which is coffee growing culture. And we realized that those two stories were almost completely disconnected. Mm. And that because they were disconnected, when we were drinking coffee here in Sydney, we had no idea where it was coming from, how much the farmers were being paid um, and what the living conditions were like. And we pretty much made a deal or, uh, Daniel, who was the local student, convinced um, Brody, who became my co-founder, who convinced me <laughs> to s essentially smuggle some coffee beans back from Uganda to Sydney with us. And if they tasted good, uh, we would see if we could sell them and start a social enterprise. And that's how it happened. We, we brought this, the beans back to Sydney, sent them to a roaster. Um, he had them tasted and said that the coffee was excellent. And then we had a deal to keep and spent the next kind of year trying to work out how to start a social enterprise. It must have been an incredible experience um, to get over to Uganda and sort of see firsthand where coffee is being grown and to meet the local farmers. Um, and geez, I take my hat off to you being able to smuggle that coffee back into Australia because we have the strictest biosecurity laws globally, I would think. So I don't know how you didn't end up getting arrested there, mate. <laughs> I think we, we have the, the strictest biosecurity laws on almost everything except coffee, and that's because Australia doesn't grow coffee, so <laughs> yeah. we're probably one of the biggest coffee drinkers in the world, and we have to get it from somewhere, so they turn a blind eye. And that's right. I mean, we're absolutely coffee fiends here in Australia, and 
I mean, how many cups of coffee are, are drunk here in Australia? Do you know that stat? I do. Um, in one year, we drink six billion cups. You're kidding me. No way. Holy no. hell. Well, I've knocked down about I mean, four this morning, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my limit is two per day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Yeah. But I guess that's where sort of you're beginning to tackle the first problem is understanding our day-to-day -day purchasing habits and the impact that we can have. So Darcy, um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit more about Cure's um, business model and how it endeavors to have a social and environmental impact. Cool. Um, you, you said, George, that you'd had uh, four cups of coffee <laughs> this morning. Is that right? Uh, you know, I kind of don't really count after the first two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of the, um, um, the French press and that just... You know, it just keeps oh, going. Oh, yeah. It's one ambiguous cup. Um, do you know where, you might know, but do you know where the coffee that you're drinking comes from? Well, today I don't. But, um, yeah, usually I try and drink my brother's coffee, which comes from Kenya. But, no, unfortunately I don't know today. Interesting. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, I, I was in the same boat three years ago before we had that trip to Uganda. I was drinking one cup of coffee a day. It tasted good. It kept me awake, but I didn't really ever stop to think about where it came from. And I think that the problem with that is that I've got no idea of what I'm contributing to in terms of social problems. And most likely uh, me drinking that coffee was keeping poor coffee farmers poor because Typically, only 10% of the economic value extracted from coffee remains in the country of origin. The other thing that I was never thinking about, and I think this is a particular problem in the city, is that after I'd finished the, the cup of coffee, um, those waste coffee grounds, I'd just probably tip in the bin. Mm. And I mean, the coffee industry is already wasteful in terms of cups, bags, and pods. But in Sydney alone, I think it's like 70,000 tonnes of coffee grounds end up in landfill every year, which is uh, pretty crazy given that that's like an amazing compost. It's, it can be used as a body scrub. You, you and I were talking about growing mushrooms on it, you know, all sorts of stuff. Yes. And the more that I researched into coffee and realized that there were these two problems or these two unanswered questions of where does my coffee come from and where does my coffee end up? And, and those kind of hid a social problem and then an environmental problem. When we started Kua, we tried to design it in a way that answered those two questions. So we sell coffee to workplaces now um, all across the city. Uh, it comes direct from smallholder farmers in Uganda. So we bypass middlemen and give them access to uh, a specialty price that's um, above the market baseline. We sell it to workplaces, then all of our profits go back to that same region to fund a climate resilience program. Mm -hmm. And that keeps around about 30% of the value in, in country. I mean, it's not ideal, wow. but it's a lot better than where it was at. And then we are zero waste. So no packaging, it's all reusable. And we collect the coffee grounds and distribute them to uh, community gardens nearby. And I guess that's, that's what we're, we, we say that it's world positive coffee. We're, we're yet to measure that properly. But our goal is to really make a positive impact by being here, by, by selling coffee. Terrific. And take, take us back to those farmers on, is it the slopes of Mount Elgon in, in Uganda? Yeah. yeah. What has been their response to um, shaggy haired Aussie uni students coming <laughs> over and saying, Hey, look, we like the look of your coffee. Um, do you want to work with us? What's been their response to, to your, your established um, business model? I think I have to be like honest here and like, we do go to every year, except this year because of COVID, we do go to Uganda and we spend about a month um, in the field. In December, we actually parked up in a national park hut and um, lived basically where the coffee is picked for a, a, about a week. I got a terrible food poisoning and it was raining all the time and horrible, but it was really <laughs> a, a really cool experience. Yeah. But um, we like, we're just, still the, the, the wealthy white people that go there and provide them a source of income. 
And to be honest, we're trying to work out how to have a more meaningful relationship with mm. our farmers. Um, how we've set up our partnerships is that there are certain producer groups that are either locally run or, or run by a charity that are really there for the sake of the farmers. And we've mm -hmm. set up long-term partnerships with them that say, hey, we can probably buy enough coffee to, um, for 75 farmers worth of harvesting. And we commit to keeping that purchase year on year on year. So our main goal is to not only say we're going to pay above market prices so that they can invest in their own farms, but we're going to pay that amount well into the future. So they've got a sustained or a sense of assurance so that they can really look at how they want to improve their livelihoods. They can commit to school fees. They can commit to all sorts of things. Perfect, Darcy. Yeah. And you touched on your trying to do a bit more around environmental impact. How does, how does that work? Um, and are you doing those initiatives with the coffee farmers as well? Um, it's like, I think it's the oldest extinct volcano in East Uganda and it's 4,000 meters high or something, but it is also one of the world's highest concentrations of coffee growers. And as the global coffee markets have pushed prices down in recent decades, coffee farmers have had to increase their farms to make the same amount of money. And what mm -hmm. that means is the national park has been essentially chopped down and the slopes have been over cultivated in order for families to survive. And then you have climate change. So no longer are there predictable harvest seasons, but there's cycles of rain and then drought and then rain. And then, I mean, we were there in December, which was meant to be picking season. It was meant to be dry and beautiful and it just rained for a month straight. Mm -hmm. And what that's meaning is when you get those, um, weather patterns on steep slopes that have been over cultivated is the whole area is very susceptible to landslides and we really wanted to find a way to use our profits to mitigate or or build solutions through that problem and there's a local organization on the ground called eco trust and what they do basically is incentivize farmers to plant native trees in amongst their coffee so it's sequestering mm -hmm. carbon they build trenched waterways and they're lined with native grasses. So that's starting to manage water flows and stabilize the, the slopes and they get an additional source of income. So they're no longer purely just having to sell more and more coffee. They've got something else to balance it out. So we give about 10, we try and operate at 10% surplus and then that goes to EcoTrust and it ends up being a about the same number of farmers that we buy from go through this uh, land regeneration program. Is it, that's, that's really terrific. Cause I think, you know, I mean, coffee is now such a global commodity. You know, you pick up the brands off the supermarket shelf and they all inevitably say this is fair trade and that they are, but I doubt that they're going that next step further, like cure and actually getting the boots on the ground. And, you know, you're identifying long-term problems such as soil degradation and climate impact and to be able to actually change the landscape in which they're using to provide their, their livelihoods. That's incredible because I know um, myself from an agriculture background, the key to sort of maintaining livelihoods is maintaining soil health and reducing soil yeah. degradation. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's incredible because you're going to the source of the problem. And next time I drink a cup of coffee, you know, I'll be thinking, <laughs> where's this from? What farmers are actually growing this and what livelihoods uh, are being impacted as, as well, a result? I'm, as a consumer, it's, it's just so confusing because you can have a million different labels that say some level of environmental or social responsibility. And it just, it doesn't make it like, yes, you can tick the box, but it doesn't tell you as the consumer whether it's any better than the product next to it that also has a similar looking label. So I think we've really tried to, we've worked a lot on our communication and those two questions are the best way that we kind of give the power to the consumer to say, Hey, is my supplier doing the right thing or can I make a better choice? And, um, I think for coffee, it's really important because I mean, you're drinking four cups a day. It's, it's part of your routine. And if you can stop and ask those questions about coffee, then maybe you can also ask those questions about what you eat for dinner or the ship t-shirt you buy or whatever. And it, hopefully it's this domino effect in terms of, um, being a, a smart consumer. Certainly. So how about the, um, the consumer end of things, as we're saying, 
you know, Sydney ciders, they're so used to, you know, the perfect latte art and they demand such good coffee. What's been their response to Cure's, um, to, I mean, your story, first of all, and then you providing um, fair access to, to social coffee? Um, I've, I've very recently got my, uh, I can do a swan now in my latte. Art. So that's, <laughs> that's taking our coffee to a whole new level. <laughs> that's been three years in the making, that one. But it, it took a long, because I was an engineer, I had no idea about coffee. And it took a long time for me to develop like the language and the taste to convince the consumers that, I mean, they're drinking, they're often used to drinking dark roasted Italian blends. And our like high altitude Ugandan is very fruity in comparison and quite a different taste. So it does take people a while to get used to. And then learning to be confident that it is actually a better coffee and how to explain that to consumers um, took a while. Mm. But now that we're, you know, three years in and we have a number of big clients on board and we've worked with our roaster to develop a recipe and we actually understand what's going on behind why it's roasted in a certain way and the flavor notes that that brings out. It's been really fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, left, I've left engineering for dead and I'm a coffee snob. Hi there. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. There's a lot more that we can do. The Global Change Maker's mission is to support youth to create positive change towards more inclusive, fair and sustainable communities. We do this by providing skills development, capacity building, mentoring and grants. Head to our website, globalchangemakers.net to learn more. Now, on with the rest of the episode. Terrific. And no, that's the, the sense I got, Darcy, when I met you in Switzerland. Um, I first asked you a bit about what you're doing and I could just sense you're so passionate about Cure and, you know, this, this field of social entrepreneurship, I guess you can say. I think you just launched Cure um what in the start of 2017 yeah so the idea was 2017 and then we kind of developed it until 2019 when we launched commercially and we must have met only six months in yeah yeah so it was all happening um at a rate of knots but so how's this journey been you know as a you know you've, you'd studied um what engineering you'd prep to go into the corporate world and earn big bucks and drink the most incredible coffee <laughs> and latte work on the way to work every morning. What I'm sure it's been a bit of a roller coaster these last three years, but you seem to be absolutely, you know, thriving um, with Cure. And yeah, just if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit more about how that sort of journey has been, how it's impacted you personally, and, and as well as your your mates who have joined you on the journey. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been a roller coaster and we've had ups and downs, but um, funnily enough, I now uh, am a tutor at university and we teach some courses on social entrepreneurship. And in the first week, we, we put a photo of a roller coaster on the slide and we just mm. say, like, welcome to this space. I mean, when you're dealing with complex problems and startups and trying to balance profit and purpose, it, there's, it's very difficult to just cruise through. Um, in terms of personally, we made it a lot harder for ourselves in some ways, um, mm. by at the end of 2018, we had about six people that were really engaged and, but at the moment it was still a university project that we were doing an hour here, an hour there. And most of us wanted to make it a serious thing, but we were also established as a charity. So we didn't have access to big investment or capital, which would allow us to take the next step. So our lack of experience in some ways taught us to think out of, outside the box and we decided to rent a six-person share house for the big garage. The garage was for the coffee, the, the six-person share house was for us and we set up the living room as an office and spent an entire year living together, working together and volunteering. It was all completely unpaid. And that was um, really good and that's why Kua survived. That's why we've got the team culture we have and that's why many of our decisions have been really backed by purpose is because we've all developed that culture together while living in the same house. But yeah, it wasn't easy. Uh, yeah. I mean, you'd go to work all day, you'd come home for dinner, you'd force yourself not to talk about work and then you'd either go to bed or you'd accidentally catch yourself having a work discussion in the kitchen till 11 o'clock yeah, at night. Yeah. Um, 
so it was really interesting. We learned a lot about communication and team dynamics, um, but I think out of it, we developed the most um, unique and, and really uh, supportive team culture. Okay. So how many um, members in the Cure team now? How many left to standing? <laughs> um, in January of this year, we were ready to start paying ourselves. So we'd learned how to have a conversation and we looked at what people wanted to do personally and what Kua was able to afford and basically made the decision to keep a core team of four people on board. Um, everyone is still involved with um, keeping up to date and coming to meetings every now and again, but there's four of us who are working about four days a week each. Not in the same house. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> God, no, but what a bold move to make, you know, just throw yourselves 100% at it and just, you know, just back yourselves. Um, I think that's a strong message for a lot of perhaps listeners listening to our podcast. Um, you know, they're all interested in starting your own, whether it be social impact projects or environmental or even just becoming big advocates for it topic they're passionate about i mean mm. you've just hit it front on and um i guess you can probably agree that you might not have known where it was going to end up but you're just passionate and eager yeah. and yeah just tell me a bit more about what got you through the challenges i mean we've just been through global pandemic and i gather that oh yeah has... that was a challenge so yeah you're obviously you've got a bit of resilience about you now darcy um yeah, well, I think for people listening, one thing I always try and say is that becoming a social entrepreneur isn't the be all and end all way to be a change maker. I mean, if you're working for an amazing company, you can achieve change often much bigger and much faster by working within that company, within those structures. Um, and becoming a social entrepreneur is just something that happened to me by accident and now I'm sticking with it. But at, in the house moment, and I wonder if people can take something from this, um, particularly for young people, I think, even when we, were, we had no idea whether what we were doing was right, we might have been um, in the middle of a disagreement or having an uncomfortable week or whatever, we always came back to the fact that we're in our early 20s, we're living together, we're starting a not-for-profit together, and it's um, not something that everyone does. So even if it's uncomfortable right now, looking back on it in five years' time, there's no way that we're going to regret that experience, whether Kua succeeds or Kua fails. And I think that that attitude of, yes, in the moment it might be uncomfortable, but ultimately what we're doing is really cool and exciting and it's going to be a funny story for our kids, has got us through living together. It probably got us through COVID. I mean, COVID, because we sell to workplaces and workplaces have shut down in what's been like two days, 90% of our orders evaporated. So we very quickly had to say, okay, what, what's, the, what's our plan? Luckily in Australia, um, the government has provided a stimulus and, and we were eligible for that. So mm -hmm. it's kept us going. But before that became available, we were forced to have a, dis a discussion around whether or not we wanted to shut shop. And in some ways it was good because it, it made everyone um, speak really openly and realistically about how long they're in this game for and where they are with their personal journeys. And ultimately, Kua is now, um, our strategy has shifted to focus only on financial sustainability in the short term. So that if our core team were to go and chase some other amazing opportunity, the social enterprise that we've left behind still survives. Mm. And I think had COVID not have happened, we wouldn't have had those conversations and come to that realization that perhaps we were gunning for something that wasn't going to be achieved. Um, cool. So, yeah, I, like I mean, without being cheesy, everything's an opportunity. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> a, look at it, you know, that's a really important point you make there, Darcy, because I mean, I've had a lot of calls now with other people doing incredible projects, but I don't think it's, I've brought it up before, the, the, the point of um, when we talk about sustainable business models and how can you make your impact um yeah continue to grow but you're sort of saying you've managed to achieve that by bringing back your team members to your core values um and why are we actually here what are we what's our main purpose and i think that's what a lot of people need to start to ask themselves i mean what's that core reason why we're doing this and you'll often find that that's the uniting cause and we'll continue to keep the fire mm. going 
So that's Absolutely. really Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess now hopefully people are starting to make their way back into the offices and you continue to provide a bit more corporate coffee solutions. Um, but so Darcy, what would be your, this is a question I common, uh, often ask, what would be your message to um, sort of young people looking to make positive social, environmental, even political change in their communities? If you have an inkling of an idea, I would say don't sit on it, write it down on a piece of paper, show it to a friend, rope the friend in, and then take it to a real life customer or target audience or mentor as soon as possible. Mm. I mean, I remember when Brody and I were in our first kind of six months of starting Kua, we, we would spend ages on planning and preparing and arguing about the logo and Ultimately, none of that was as important as getting our coffee in front of a customer and seeing if we could um, actually like, make an impact in this market. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky that we fell in with some mentors and some really good programs at the university that helped us take those next steps. Sure. But we could have been a lot faster. So I think if you are passionate about something, there's like get into it now and find someone to help you out with it because social impact is all about collaboration and um, very much, yeah, about giving it a shot. Definitely. Yeah. And I also see a lot of people beginning to support startups and, you know, there's a lot of grants you can now access. So, and even some companies are willing to do pro bono work. So there's a lot of, yeah, like I said, opportunities out there. And I think, yeah, it'd be silly not to tap into them. <laughs> Absolutely. And now more than ever, I mean, the whole world is changing. So people are really open to new ideas at the moment. Mm. Um, so Darcy, like, do you have any um, new sort of projects on the run or ideas you could sort of give us a sneak peek into with Cure? Um, yeah, I, I've got one. Um, so we've had this tension this whole time around, I mean, I talked, we, we touched on like the relationship with farmers and when we go to Uganda, we bring a camera and we try and tell stories, but the stories are always told through our eyes, which isn't the most genuine and transparent way to tell the stories of people on the other side of the world. Mm. And with COVID, we're not going to be able to go to Uganda. So that initially was a challenge. But then we um, were actually inspired by, by another not-for-profit that ran a program where they basically shelled out all of these film cameras to their participants and said, we don't care uh, what photos you take. We just want to understand climate change or we want to understand the impacts of our programs through your eyes. And I thought that that was such a beautiful way to tell stories. So... Mm. Over the last couple of months, we've basically, when people order coffee, we've been slipping a uh, film camera in it and a return sendal slip wow. so that they take eight photos of their experience drinking coffee or their family life or whatever um, here in, this, in, in Sydney or Australia. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of photos now and we're just about to send the photos and the cameras to Uganda, to our farmer partners. They're going to receive like photos of their coffee being enjoyed on the other side of the world then go out to their farms and take photos of their day and when we bring those photos together we're hopefully going to join those two dots between crop and cup in a really uh genuine way so it's called camera swap and That's yeah it's incredible on our Instagram idea. At, yeah wow no that's bloody exciting because i think that's that's what really people are after. They want to know, you know, who's, who's producing the food that they're consuming or the coffee that they're drinking. Um, and to create that sort of human connection, you know, that's very powerful. Mm, mm. And yeah, you know, these growers and you know, the impact that you, you know, your business model is having on their lives, their families. And I think that's, that's a really sort of creative and, and excellent idea. So um, I'll be ordering some Cure coffee and taking some snaps, <laughs> some selfies. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Darcy, look, it's been really good to catch up again today. Unfortunately, we could, I know we could chat all day, but um, I know you've got things to do, and, um, but we'll have to get you on the podcast another time and see how Cure is progressing. So cheers. Yeah, nice. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks, mate. 
Hey, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Remember to help us create a greater impact by sharing this and encouraging everyone on your social media to take a listen. If you want to reach out, you can contact the host via podcast at global-changemakers.net or feel free to message us on Instagram at Global Changemakers and Twitter at WeRGCM. We'll be very happy to talk to you and answer any questions. Remember to follow us and subscribe to this podcast. See you in the next episode. Take care.